Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hi, welcome everyone to The Learner's Show, broadcasting live to you today from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, I'm your host, Deborah Hildebrand, and for the next hour or so, we will be talking about education, ed tech, women in STEM, and related topics with our special guest, Naomi Harm. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, The Learnist, which is the place to go if you are an instructional designer or business owner who is either developing or looking to develop an online course. Uh, it is also the place for organizations or companies looking to create an online training course or program. If you follow me on social media, you know my background is in project management and teaching project management at several universities. So at The Learnist, I teach course creators and instructional designers how to manage the course curriculum development process, as well as the launch of any course. Uh, So if you'd like to learn more, you can go to thelearnist.com. That's T-H-E-L-U-R-N-I-S-T dot com. So I'm really excited today to have our guest, Naomi Harm. She's a women in leadership strategist and STEM innovation specialist and also CEO of Innovator Educator Consulting. Thank you so much, Naomi, for joining me. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. It is a privilege and an honor to be here. And I call it just a quick jump, skip, and a hop just to get down here from (laughs) Cave Creek. So it was a lovely drive down this morning. And to all of you out there, it is a beautiful sunny day outside today. So no complaining here. Yeah, it's beautiful today. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to get warmer. It's been so cold in Phoenix. Yeah, they say cold, (laughs) but really? I know. It's pretty nice. I know. we We both came from the northern United States, so we really know what cold is, right? I'm from Seattle. You're from uh, Minnesota. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm not missing that snow one bit nope, at all. Nope. It's snowing right now in Seattle, which is always a disaster. Right, right. So we did have Confident Plus Connected Kids founders, Danny and Delena, uh, who were scheduled to join us today. Uh, but Danny had a tragedy in her family this weekend. So we're rescheduling them from April and our hearts um, and prayers go out to Danny and her family. But as Aunt Naomi does have so much in the education field, I think we should be able to fill up an hour. <laughs> I think I have probably too much, right? And I'm really excited for it. So, Naomi, if you could take a few minutes um, to introduce yourself to the listeners, that'd be great. Okay. Well, hello, everyone out there. I'm so glad that you joined us today. And I've had the privilege and honor to only get to know Deborah for about the last month. And it was so interesting getting to meet her online due to we both have a wonderful focus area of women in leadership, but really how we are future ready and future proofing for teaching and learning in that environment to inspire teachers and students basically worldwide. I am here with you today to share a little bit about my company and what we do to transform the world. And a lot of people always ask, what do you do? Well, my biggest focus is how can we transform the world to make it a better place, but how we can empower students and teachers to be part of that learning journey. That's awesome because that's our future, right? The that's schools, right? right? Um, so that's why I'm, I'm really excited to have you on today to talk about that. And you have such a great professional career, and I know the listeners are going to get a lot of great advice from you. So let's get started. How could you describe what your educational company, Innovator Educator Consulting, does differently to prepare K-12 schools and educational leaders to be future ready? Well, that's a great question, by the way. (laughs) And what we do to prepare is our company is quite unique. Um, It's very much grounded in ISTE standards, which stands for the International Society for Technology and Education. Those are our technology literacy standards to help us to guide, to mentor, and to really focus on learning outcomes and learning targets to making sure that we're moving the needle in K-12 education. But what I'm really excited about is that I work with a team of extremely talented, brilliant, and creative women leaders throughout the U.S. I do have some great educators also that are male teachers that do come on board because they're like, I want to be part of this too. (laughs) And of course, you have to bite them on board. But also what we do so differently is that not only when we prepare our content for workshops, when we give face-to-face workshops or online courses, We really make sure that the experiences are there for teachers to have hands-on learning experiences. So many times in workshops, people are just a talking head, and they just lecture and lecture. And that experience 
can connect with a few individuals, but when we look at the brain research, there's so many individuals that learn in at least three different modalities. They need the touch, they need to see, they need to have that feel, of course, but then they they need to do, and they need to see that visualization. Mm -hmm. So because of that, all of our concepts and content that we design and create, making sure that it's learner-centered focused, and that our talk time, that when we introduce new concepts, is normally 12 minutes or under for new ideas. And then we expand that out to let teachers or students that we're working with to dive into the content, to really be engaged and to create and make and to try to really understand how it all works and how it fits together with their background knowledge, but then connecting with new knowledge so that more questions are actually generated so that they feel like they have more ownership in the learning and that they feel like, oh, I'm connecting with this, or they feel safe that they can ask questions and say, I don't get this. I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. Can you help guide and coach me in this direction? But what we also do, and that's why I love working uh, with a lot of the schools I do, and I'm going to give a few shout outs here, the Howard (laughs) Howard (laughs) Schwamical School District in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I would say the Lake Geneva School District also in Wisconsin are some of my favorite schools I've ever worked with in my 25 years in education because they are doing it right. They really put teachers at the center of learning, but also It's the students that are most important, and they listen to student and teacher voice when it comes to what types of professional learning development that they need, they want, and what they can do to help just really um, just kickstart their types of learning in the classroom that are different than any other school district that's around. Howard Swamico in particular has a great future-proofing focus where it looks at learner-centered curriculum, but also where kids are identified through, they're called graduate profiles. What does it look like when a student graduates from Wisconsin? How are they going to be successful? And successful means when they go out into a technical career, when they go out to a four-year degree college, or whether they're immersed right away into the business workforce. And I really like that because they are focusing on just-in-time jobs, techniques, and bringing in experts from the outside. So kids aren't learning after the fact. They're learning right now. And they are so immersed in the culture with the kids that the teachers are learners themselves with the students. And they're empowering the kids to be teachers in the classrooms too. That's what I really like about these schools that I work with. That's great. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So when you when you give them the experience of being a teacher, then they can evaluate it better, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, so uh, when you share insights on Generation Z and mm-hmm. Generation Alpha students, how can you define who this new generation of students are? And then what makes them so different from previous generations, such as baby boomers, the Generation Xers and millennial and millennials. Yeah, exactly. When when you talk about those different types of generations, and it's amazing, it spans over so much time, and it seems like it transforms every twenty to twenty five years. And our students that are right now in the K through twelve space are really our Generation Z students, but also the beginning students coming in right now that are our pre K, kindergarten, first and second graders. Those children are known as Generation Alpha, and when you relate and hear the word alpha. What do you normally think about Deborah at first? Well, I, I think military because yeah. <laughs> alpha, right? I mean, it's yeah. just the, the name for A, alpha. Yeah, A for or alpha. Or first. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, first. And even sometimes some people associate it with like a dog pack, like alpha. Oh, yeah. Okay. Pack. I didn't even think about that. True. Yeah. Yes. So our alpha students that are just starting out their educational careers are really focused, driven, and they're going to change Ah. the world. So those kids, they think, they learn, and they process information so differently than our kids even from fourth grade to 12th grade. So here we have this challenge. Teachers are like, I've got this new set of kids coming in with different mindsets, different passions, different drives. And then I've got the other kids at the other end of the spectrum that we're supposed to be training for the career workforce and college. But now we've got two different groups of kids, and how do we learn with them? How do we teach them? What do we do differently? Well, That's why teachers have got to change also their mindsets and how they deliver just creative curriculum, how they offer really hands-on thinking and learning opportunities and provide those experiences that are much different. Our kids right now, I can even say I have a granddaughter that's six years old 
And she, you have three grandchildren. I have three granddaughters, okay. yes. Okay. I have three grandbabies, <laughs> but our oldest one is, is six years old. She's currently in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, she is definitely an alpha. Even when I go to visit her, she's so driven. She wants to do everything for herself, and she mm-hmm. wants to try it without anybody helping first. She can figure it out without, like, reading the directions. She has to tinker. She has to play. She has to make. But she wants to be immersed in that type of learning. And I love how that is because they're not afraid of anything. Where we as adults, sometimes we learn a new technology. We're a little bit more hesitant now. Right. And even for me being in the technology world my entire life, sometimes it takes two or three times to figure it out. Right now, it takes a little (laughs) bit longer. Me too. A little longer, yeah. Yeah. And then our Generation Z kids that are really from our fourth graders on up to high school, but also our kids that are just starting out in the workforce, those kids are really game changers as well. Those are the first generation that really want to make a difference in our world. They want the good in our world. And they don't want to deal with all these politics that are currently going on, and I won't get into any of that, but they want to find the good in each and every person, and they want to save our world, and they want to make sure that it's sustainable for years to come. And what I love about the passion that this group of students is, they also are so technology literate, but I should say that they're picking and choosing what types of technology that works for them Mm -hmm. the best. Some of them are finding balance, but some of them are not. And because of that, the technology is consuming their world, which is also causing too much emotional stress on their brains, on their bodies, and how they interact with people. They don't know when to put the tech down. They don't know when to have the balance and to have the face-to-face conversations and to look at the social context clues when we're talking and knowing what to do. So when our employers are hiring these students fresh out of high school or into college, it's like we have to work with the soft skills again with these children because we we need to help them know that eye contact is important. Um, A handshake in some scenarios that we have to greet and meet and also staying on tax task and paying attention to what is meant for me to be successful and completing that end job. And for some of them, they want to bury their heads in that phone. So we've got to model more skills for that type of generation. Our previous generations, as you and I and others that are here, um, we've had more of that balance because technology was introduced to us after the time that we've started our, Mm -hmm. our workforce and our job careers of what we've had. We've found a little bit better way to balance But our Generation Key Z kids and then our Alpha kids, we need to model that more often to provide those hands-on learning experiences to build that lifelong learning confidence so that they can choose the right direction and make the right choices when they are in that job or in that employment. And so part of your curriculum is to help teachers to deal with those changing students? Yes, absolutely. And what types of teaching methodologies to reach out and meet these kids because especially for our kids that are, like I said, the pre-K, kindergarten, first and second grade kids coming in, they can walk circles around the teacher in the classroom right now when it comes to technology. It's amazing. Like and their I grandmother. Said, and, their, and their grandmother, absolutely. It's amazing what they can do. Uh-huh. They're not afraid of anything. And they have really have grown up and born actually in the womb. Think about it with technology. Right. I mean, their first digital footprint, when you think about it, is that when your granddaughters, found, when you found them out right away, I'm sure their mothers sent probably the sonogram or the copy of the photo picture. And mm-hmm. right away, what do people share out? They put it on Instagram. They put it on Facebook. Yeah. Actually, they're already creating that digital footprint for that child without right. even asking that child, do you want your digital footprint out there on the web? So our kids basically... Our Generation Alpha kids will be at about a 96% digital footprint already starting by the time or previous before being born, where our digital native kids being in Generation Z, they say that's about 92% because not all kids want to be in that social space right now, which is different. Wow. So that's it, amazing. Yeah. Because yeah, when I think about running my business and the way I have to market differently to the millennials, and now mm-hmm. we have to think about this new generation Z and alpha, that's, that's, yeah, that's very, that's powerful. Yeah, it is. And the last thing I just wanted to summarize with is what we found that really works well with working with kids that are our big, I call them the littles. The littles are our pre-K through second grade kids, really. Uh And then our third grade through 12th grade kids. What really helps is that if we can offer them basically smaller content or snackable 
bite-sized chunks of information. Because the information, like even for us, it's coming at us so quickly and mm-hmm. so fast. And it's like, what do I pick and choose that's most important? What do I choose to, you know, transfer to my back lobe of my brain or from my frontal lobe to my back quadrant of my brain to store for long-term memory? And then what is it that I just kind of just let it go and pick it up later? So smaller bite-sized pieces of information will really resonate with our students. And when we teach the concepts right now, we do the same for teachers. And the other thing that we do for our teachers is that we give them those small pieces of information and then we introduce new concepts. Then we give them what's called rotation stations. We give them three learning experiences and groups. the groups rotate between three experiences within that hour. So they're not so overwhelmed. Right. They can taste it. They can feel it. They can work with it. And then they can see if they like it or not. And then we rotate to the next one. Oh. But they're working in teams and groups. So we're also modeling just the power of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Because we talk about kids should collaborate, but we don't model it effectively enough with us as adult learners. And we have to do that more often for kids to be successful, to be effective communicators, listeners, but also collaborators in that space. That's amazing. I love that. So you might have already talked about this, but how do we as a collaborative society prepare today's K-12 students for their futures? um, And even by the year 2030, And what types of skill sets should we be preparing them for um, to make them highly marketable in a diverse global economy? Yeah. Big question, right? Very, (laughs) very. huge, and we have plenty of time to talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It is. Well, I had the privilege and honor. I did the closing keynote up in Vancouver, British Columbia in December um, Mm -hmm. on behalf of ISTE. So the International Society for Tech and Education. And again, they set our national and international technology literacy standards. It was a privilege and an honor to provide that closing keynote to work with so many ed tech leaders, even from the the, within Canada, because they too are really looking at what does future proofing look like? What are the skills of tomorrow for 2030? What does that look like? And sometimes we just have to take a step back and saying, you know, even these powerful devices that we have of our of our phones, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are the most tech savvy and tech literate people in the group. We need to really reflect more often and model ways that we can be better communicators, listeners, active participants, but they'll, but but being an active listener to listen to understand. So many times we have conversation and we're just ready to add another thought to it without mm-hmm. really listening to the person and being empathetic of listening to that person of understanding their why to help them solve or find a new solution to something. So the skills of tomorrow is that the the biggest thing is that we need to model what collaboration looks like. We need to model effective communication. And we also need to model effective ways in which we respond to an individual. And that means sitting back and thinking before we talk at times, processing the information a little bit more. <laughs> And then even sometimes just reflecting by just having a quick write or, or putting your thoughts down before you respond. Because I think right now so many people respond so quickly as soon as they're asked a question, they're not maybe really answering it or they're only getting in their two cents to really validate themselves and not contributing to solving a bigger problem of why you're there together as a team. Mm -hmm. So the other 2030 skills is that we really need to have opportunities for kids to have learning experiences. And the brain research proves the more hands-on learning experiences builds lifelong learning confidence. And that's the number one factor also for girls when it comes to STEM. But the second um, attribute, too, for the girls with STEM is that they need role models or mentors Mm -hmm. to see what women leaders look like, what we do, what we do differently, how we communicate, how we collaborate to maintain that interest in STEM. And those skills are the skills that they will need tomorrow because we can already see our tech world. It is what is it they say right now? How much tech, you know, it quadruples in so much time oh, over it's in ridiculous. one year. It's crazy, right? right? I know. It's crazy. I know. So because of that, um, the research also shows that girls drop out of even their biggest STEM focus areas mm-hmm. when it comes to be about middle school years. And that's because a lot of our thematic units happen at the K through four, five, six level by 
six, seven, eight, sometimes we already separate subject areas. They're Mm -hmm. not integrated. So things are taught separately, almost like in a silo, and they're not meaningful ties. And because of that, we're all of a sudden losing teachers at the middle school and then high school that are not necessarily women teachers. We have more male teachers when it comes up to upper, middle, up, and then up into high school. We, we're seeing that as a nationwide trend, and it's been there for a very long time. Hmm. But what we need to do is have more women role models. And ways that we've done that, too, for the 2030 skills is that we need to bring in more women leaders via the webinar, via a Hangout, you know, Google Hangout, Skype, whatever you want to use. And girls need to see what women are doing differently, how they got there, and to listen to those stories. Because girls are very detailed and very organized. We have a little step up on some of these mm-hmm. these men and these I boys agree. that we work with. <laughs> Our brains think and work differently. They're mm-hmm. very similar, but we like the detail. And when it comes to the detail, we want to hear the story or the backbone to make the connection to relate it to our lives and make it more personable. And then we find that passion of where STEM relates to what we want to do. So I'm very driven, as you can as you can tell as well, too. Yeah. I do a lot of mentoring, a lot of role modeling for girls because we need to give them the opportunity. And what happens when they don't have the access or the ac- or equity to these learning experiences because they drop off by that middle school year, girls all of a sudden will just say, okay, I'll go into this career or I'll do this. Or somebody says, I should do this. They need to have a voice and a choice in that learning. It's so important. And the more opportunity that we as women leaders can afford them experiences and can afford them an opportunity to model what leadership skills look like, it's going to build that lifelong learning confidence with these girls. And these girls also can be the best role models to boys in the classroom. And it's going to make really a really harmonious um, community of learners right within a classroom. And that's what should be happening. It shouldn't be between the ifs and that or the haves and have nots. Right. It's how can we build a stronger community of learners between both sexes and so that we both can get along and that we can both find ways that we can truly collaborate and really change our world for good. That's where we're at. Yeah, because it's uh, really only going to be uh, better for our community and our country and our and our world. So I agree. I think we're going to talk about it a little later, but I wanted to ask you this question now. Is there any type of organization or organization that uh, leaders, women leaders such as myself can go to to mentor these young girls? I love that you brought that question up. This is awesome. That's awesome. Yes, yes. I'm going to shout to the rooftop. Yep. Good. There's so many. There's so many. It's like, where do I start? One of my favorite that I get introduced to probably three, three years ago when I was in California is it's called careervillage.org. Career Village is an online site that is basically the backbone is made by teachers for teachers, but it's a place where it's a safe haven where kids can come in and teacher groups can come in to mentor students. But what's wonderful about this is that they have experts in the field from Dell, uh, HP Computers, wow. NASA, Intel Education, um, all kinds of different businesses, all kinds of different startups are actually in there too. Wow. So kids go and ask questions to ask them if what they're interested in, basically they'll note, let's say, I'm really interested in the medical field, but I have this love for technology and I really have a specialty area that's maybe in biology and I'm really interested in um, stem cell research. Kids can ask questions in there and usually within 24 hours, they're going to get a response from a neuroscientist or a biologist. No. Absolutely. Wow, that's so cool. It's really cool. So that's an area that we can go in and mentor and help our okay. future students. So we have a lot of our kids that are in their um, uh, end of middle school, high school, but also a lot of our students that are in college. And they're just trying to find directionality of which focus areas, which classes should I take, but would this meet my need? The other one is Million Women Mentors. Okay. That has over a million already students that have been mentored. And it's an amazing, amazing online um, system. Um, I mentor in there as well. Uh, maybe you do too? I have not, oh. but I but I will. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is incredible. Because not only can you sign up as a mentor, you can have schools sign up as their whole class, their whole classrooms, or it can be a total organization too. Wow. So a lot of organizations, because they've been in my past careers, I was a Dell for Dell Education, I started up their West Coast Division for Education Strategy. Mm-hmm. And what we did there is 
that was introduced to me as well for Million Women Mentors and Career Village. And that was our give back to help our society become more wholesome, more pure, more true, and to just really help our kids, you know, to get, to get a foot in the door and especially our girls. That's what I'm excited that. about. I love yeah. that. So we'll yeah. post um, both of those in the okay. show notes. Yeah. And I'll, tw- and I'll tweet those out. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we were talking about tweet- Twitter l- yeah. earlier. So I think you did talk about this, but what, uh, so what do your face-to-face blended and online professional learning offerings look like and feel like to prepare and transform today's K-12 educational school leaders, um, the communication and collaborati- collaboration skill sets? So you did talk about mm-hmm. how those are, and I, and I love that you talked about soft skills, right, mm-hmm. for 2030, because when I was back, when I was learning, it was more technical skills that we needed, right? And now right. we're going back to the soft skills. So how do your offerings, um, uh, uh, you know, prioritize those types of soft skills? Right. And that's a really good question as well that you've asked, because it's nice to work with the leaders, because we can talk a good talk of what we want to do. But if the leaders don't experience the same types of learning opportunities that our children or our teachers will be modeling, it's almost worthless. So um, the bigger picture is when we work with these leaders, they too become learners in the classroom. So when we offer our workshops, we will model it just as we work with teachers as we would with students because they need to be immersed in that learning so that they can feel like they're a kid again. They need Mm -hmm. to experience that joy, that happiness, and that curiosity, right? right? I think a lot of us as adult learners, we've been there for so long and it's like, I want to be a kid again. I want to have that fun. I want to have that (laughs) hand on time and I want to tinker and I want to play, I want to make. Right. So a lot of our um, online classes that we do that are a little different, like um, one that I'm currently creating for the Howard Swamp Gold School District, because to blend that because I can't be there every waking moment Mm -hmm. of the hour for them because I'm here in Arizona, they're in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. So what we do is we build in webinars, we'll build in the podcast components, we'll build in challenges, challenges to actually have teachers, administrators take a risk and they can have a choice as well. So we, we set it up according to modules and then small snackable chunks that they mm-hmm. pick and choose activities that resonate with them but are aligned to their standards that they want to meet, and they create and make, and then they also showcase their learning so they have an authentic audience that they represent it to as well. So that's the same thing that we want for kids. We want the blended opportunity to not only can I meet with you face-to-face, but then we offer the online component that they can still see me through a webinar or they can watch an archived webinar to meet mm-hmm. them at their time. And then the little um, snackable chunk activities gives the teachers or the students the choice. And then they can get that critical feedback. And that's the other component. The assessment piece, the critical feedback, that's key. That's really, really right. important right now. Kids want instantaneous feedback because, again, what are they? They're constantly on these devices. <laughs> and they want that immediacy. Right. And we think of adults, too. I try, I try my best to get back to individuals within 24 hours of an email. Usually that's not probably very realistic for a lot of people mm-hmm. because they say that should be about three days. Well, I, my habit has always been I try to get back to people right away. But then all of a sudden, your email is over-consuming you, right? Mm-hmm. You've got to find the balance. But in today's world with the apps, it makes it much quicker of how we can respond to individuals. Right. The same way for an online component, because you can have a wonderful learning discussion thread that's built in that you can have that online through a computer, but you can also have the app on your phone that you can get back to individuals. But the biggest thing is to respect individ- individuals' space and to find that balance. We can only consume so much information. And so really identifying what are the learning outcomes, what are the goals, and what we're trying to achieve, those are most important too as part of the online courses that we set up for our teachers. But it also is, we always front load it with a rubric is what we call it, or the online assessment. So mm-hmm. they know what's expected. We don't ever want to blindside our teachers. Right. We want them to have an opportunity to create, to make, and then use that rubric as a guide and the ISTE tech skills. Or we, we also have the NGSS, which is the na- next generation science standards as well that we use. And really helping that, that's a guide or a framework to help our teachers know I am doing the right thing. And when I need to ask more questions, I can come back and help you with that. So that online communication, again, built into those classes and then face-to-face, it's just like we don't miss a beat. And it really builds, again, a stronger community of learners when we're teaching 
in schools and then when we're learning online so that we can keep that communication very robust and very open. Right. I mean, I teach a lot of online classes and that's my biggest challenge is to get people, uh, you know, into the discussions and, and, you know, of course, grading on time, which is uh, right. a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I agree completely with everything you just said. I yeah. love it. And I love that you're teaching um, the K-12, those types of um, skill sets, because online learning is the wave of the future, right? I mean, yeah. it just is. So that's great. Um so as CEO of your own ed tech women in leadership company, how do you know what strategies to lead with to transform a school's culture to make lasting and positive change? Yeah, that's one of my <laughs> probably my favorite questions right there. Well, I lead with my heart a lot. I do listen to my gut, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I, love do. It. I do. So do I do. <laughs> because you can just tell when something's not right, and it's just resonating with you and it's like, "Wow, let me just take a step back." But to lead and to transform a culture, what's very important for me as well is the relationships. The relationships that I build with schools nationwide and worldwide, it's very important to really focus on what is the need, what is the change that you want to see to take place that's really going to impact the learning of all children and of every ability. We're not leaving anybody out. Love it. And it's the same way for teachers. I don't want to leave any teacher out either. We know that all teachers have different technology literacy skill sets. Mm -hmm. We need to meet them where they're at, find out what they're truly passionate about, find that favorite unit of study, even if it's something they've taught 20 years in a row. But what can we do to kick it up a notch, as Emerald would say? What can we do to flavor up that recipe, which is a lesson, mm -hmm. and help you create something that is just 10 times better than you could ever imagined? And sometimes even when we talk about our veteran teachers, I'm a veteran teacher. So am I. Right? Yeah. We're veteran mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. But what can we do to improve our practice and our approach? But it all comes back to relationships. And to build a culture, it's to have really effective communication and to meet more frequently than less frequently, actually, but to respect time. So when I work with administrators, or even school boards, do we really need an hour face-to-face? -face? Let's think about it. If we have a very well-prepared agenda and we stick to the agenda, mm -hmm. we could actually probably give you 15 or 20 minutes back of your time and letting individuals know that their time is respected so they can go back out and change the world in that classroom or in that next meeting with a parent. That's what it's about right now. But the culture of other changers that we do make is that we need to celebrate learning. We don't do that enough in education. Mm -mm. And we, we do see leaps and bounds. And for us as an educator, it's like, gosh, this is great. And then sometimes we compare ourselves to the neighboring district. district and it's like, well, they're at a different place right now. We've got to really look at our strategic plan and where our vision is at. And we have to celebrate as a community. And the more opportunity when teacher teams can work together as collaborative teams, that builds a stronger community too. You're breaking down the silos. And in all of our trainings, we don't have single teachers come to our workshops or in our trainings. And even when I work within school districts, when we do district-wide trainings, we always focus on a collaborative team. So if I'm working with third through eighth grade teachers, we're making sure that there's at least two to three. I, I love three. I call it a transformative trio uh -huh. because those individuals can have better, deeper, insightful conversations about making change of what they need to focus on. Two will work. I call that the dynamic duo. That will work too. <laughs> but three can go back and really make change and that empowers them to go back. And then they can actually be a train the trainer or a peer coach to their team. So again, it's relationships, it's collaborative team building, mm -hmm. and it's also empowering others to be dynamic creators and teachers are new designers and having choice in what they're creating to make an impact in the classroom. That's great. I, I was having a conversation last week with someone uh, about motivating teachers to change. And, and it's really difficult because, I, I mean, I'm a teacher as well, and changing curriculum is hard and bringing in new things is hard uh, because, you know, it just takes time and effort. And yeah, it's, um, I love that you're doing that. Uh, okay. So from your 20 plus years in the educational field, how do you know when to lean in to ensure your leadership voice and expertise is being heard and validated 
to contribute to positive change in today's K-12 teaching and learning environments. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big (laughs) one. And that quote there, that lean in, Uh um, Sheryl Sandberg, man, she's a powerful woman. And I look to her a lot for leadership. So I look to a lot of different women um, for leadership and what they're doing to have their voice heard and when to lean in to have that deeper conversation, but then also when to kind of just sit back and process and just really actively listen. And I I have done much better, I should say, in the last probably 10 years of actively listening to understand so that when I contribute to the conversation, that your voice is heard. Because if you always dominate the conversation, your team or others that you're working with are like, oh boy, there's Naomi. She's just spouting (laughs) off again, right? But when we really listen to understand, to be Mm -hmm. part of the bigger community, to solve the problem and know that we're moving the needle in education, that's what it's about right now. And then we can measure those outcomes. But a lot of times we as women, when we lean in, sometimes that we are considered being aggressors now. Mm -hmm. And when we speak with authority or we speak up, I mean, I have a pretty good teacher voice. There's times that people say, would you want a microphone to speak to these teachers? I said, oh, no, No. I've got a very loud teacher voice. (laughs) But I want individuals to hear my inflection in my voice because I'm not a monotone speaker. And because of that, I want to reinforce or emphasize key words or certain words that would resonate with the teachers I'm working with so that they can understand where I'm coming from. I will tell stories through my keynotes and also my types of presentations. I will give key teaching strategies or scenarios that if I've worked with a group of teachers and I've gotten the permission to share that story, I've always asked before I mention a a school or a teacher name to get permission first, (laughs) but to share how it's made a difference. I know this works because, and then I can give the research behind it. I can give the teacher scenario and I'll even say, you know what? Let's contact that teacher. Here's her Twitter account. Here's what she's done. Here's some online lessons. Teachers need to get that buy-in. They need to see the Mm -hmm. realism. They need to see that somebody is actually out there doing it. They need to hear the story. But again, leaning in, I love to have the opportunity to lean in because just to empower others of sharing the story of what you know what works, but also leaning in and saying, you know what? I know that doesn't work. This is what's happened to Mm -hmm. me. Yet, let me hear your side of the story why you think it will work. And using choice words of still still listening to them, using yet more often (laughs) instead of but. (laughs) And we as women have to quit saying sorry all the time. We probably hear that. Sorry, (laughs) sorry, sorry, you know, sorry. We can acknowledge it and say, thank you for the opportunity for bringing me that glass of water today. Wow, that was wonderful. Yet, I can take care of myself. That's okay. I'll get that next time. You know, something like that. We as, we've as we got to find a different way to strategize our word choices and phrases that we use to show that we are in control. We're acknowledging that person still with kindness because kindness always wins no matter what. But finding a way to to really showcase that we are strong, we're here to make change, and we're part of the bigger conversation. Love it. And I apologize is not a substitute for I'm sorry, right? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I don't want to say I'm sorry, but can I say apologize? No. (laughs) It's still You're still saying you're sorry. (laughs) I love it. So with all the overwhelming amounts of technology information that we have to sit through on a daily basis, um, what are some tips, tricks, and strategies that you utilize and recommend to stay relevant um, in our professional field and career? Yeah, it's really important for us as women, especially, that we need to put our professional and our personal needs first. And we as women do not do that. Mm -hmm. I've After all of my lifelong career and being here now, Being over 50 years old, I still, like, I find I put my family first, which is great. Mm -hmm. I do put my friends first a lot of times before myself, and I always come last. And that's not so good sometimes because we only have so much energy to give back to others. And if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't help take care of others or to really be part of just the health wellness um, community with everybody that we work with. So the tips and tricks and strategies I use, I'm very much, I'm avid on Twitter. Now, Twitter's been around for a long time, but Mm -hmm. I use Twitter for educational good. And there's a lot of things that we see and others that are out there, not naming any names, but people are out there putting (laughs) negative things out there. That's Mm -hmm. not good. That doesn't do anybody good. I use it as an educational platform for my voice and choice in my learning. 
And when I don't know something, I know that I can ask a question or pose a question, and within less than probably two or three minutes, I'm going to get a response from a teacher friend worldwide that's going to help and guide my thinking, my coaching, and help me strategize or to think differently about what I can create or make. So I use that platform. We have a large community of uh, hashtags that we use with a lot of our teachers that when you're following a certain focus, especially, so let's say if I, I want to learn more about STEM, S-T-E-M, which stands for science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM education, or STEAM. But following those hashtags, all of a sudden, it's helping me filter through all that information we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And now I can just see the tweets that are going to help me gain new, insightful ideas to really energize my next lesson or activity. My other things I do, I'm very avid too on LinkedIn. Um, I don't post as much there, but I follow and connect with women leaders that are there worldwide. I really feel LinkedIn has helped me as a professional of a business owner, more so than the standpoint from an education Mm -hmm. standpoint. And it's really connected with me and to connect with other business leaders of women. That's what I love about that. And we can have conversations and help each other that way. Other connections, um, I'm not as avid on Instagram as maybe I should be. It's because I love no, the tw- I, lo- I love the Twitter. I love the Twitter part. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's kind of just where I am. See, I called that's where I'm a little bit old school yet, but yeah. I'll I'll get there. It's okay. But you can only have so many social platforms. I've right. got Facebook. I've got LinkedIn. No, you, got- it, it, it's really the strategy should be to concentrate on one. Mm-hmm. And um, and you do you do you concentrate on Twitter. So right. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else that you, just, technology-wise, that you... Just technology-wise to stay up to date. Uh-huh. I One of my tips and tricks of the trade, and I've taught other people this too, is I am very much a gratitude-filled person. I try my best in the morning to identify what I will be filled with gratitude for the day, focusing on what my job skill will be, whether it's face-to-face training, whether it's here today on your educational mm-hmm. podcast show, whether it is creating content. Yesterday, I created content for like 12 hours, you know, and it's like, okay, I got to stay focused here. How's this going to happen? So because of that, I identify of what I'm thankful for. I wake up in the morning is what my gratitude fill is. And then I do write down periodically throughout check-ins about every two hour. If I'm stuck on something, I'll write something quickly down. And then I see, can see my strategy of how I get through something when I struggle. My other moment is what I tell individuals. I drink a lot of water. Water is my choice beverage, really. It really is. <laughs> I love it. I, I drink probably my body weight, if not more, per day. I do. <laughs> it's in here or here, Phoenix, Arizona, Tempe. You know what? We got to drink water here. Boy. But the other thing is, I like to start up my morning watching a TED video an ah. inspirational TED motivational video. And I try to find them around women leadership, STEM, motivation, and inspiration. For me, visualization and hearing is the best way that I learn. And for that learning strategy, it helps me stay focused. And I usually take a key idea or concept, and then I incorporate it into my next training or learning. So I have to stay up to date, right? Yeah, and, that's and, great. And so that's what I use. But I, I do a lot of research too. I still read old-fashioned books. Me yep, too. There, I need mm-hmm. the tangibility in the feel. That's the other thing that I do need. I love listening to audio podcasts. So if I take my morning walk, when I can get my walk in the morning, mm-hmm. um, I'll listen to audio books in different ways. And I can get in 15, 30 minutes as, as a time frame that way. But I try my best to keep up to date. And I use... I say ISTE is my guide, my International Society for Tech and Education. They got lots of wonderful research articles of how to stay relevant and how to future-proof your next your next initiative within your school district. So they have just been wonderful uh, to work with in general. But at the same time, they offer lots of documentation and lots of guides to help me when I work with school districts. Great. I love it. I love all okay. of that. That's okay. just a little piece of you yeah. that, that we got this morning. Yeah. That's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about STEM because or women in STEM because I just love this subject. Yeah. I actually mentor for Seed Spot, and okay. the last weekend that I did, there were a couple of groups there that were, were young girls who um, had given up on STEM uh, in high oh. school for various reasons and then went back to it. And um, so they were they were doing some startups to um, try to alleviate that for other younger mm-hmm. girls in STEM, which I think is great. So when you're mentoring girls and young women in STEM and role modeling the importance of women in leadership, how do these mentoring life skills impact the young women success rates of pursuing a passionate driven career in STEM? So how does mentoring affect that? Yeah. The key factor 
for the difference for girls right now for them to pursue a passion-driven career in STEM? And the research states is that these girls need to have mentorship opportunities. They also need to have a role model that is a woman leader. Leader meaning it can be a teacher. It could be a guardian. Mm -hmm. It could be a grandparent. It could be someone down at the local coffee shop, but it's they connect and work with. And these these girls need to know that they have someone that they can entrust in, know they can also build their leadership skills and talk about their career-driven passions. And a lot of times what happens, what you just said also at the high school, that the mm -hmm. girls are dropping out of STEM. A key example of that, my niece who lives down in Claremont, Iowa, um, she just went on a site visit to Iowa State University. And she has chosen her major to be in computer science. This is awesome. I, I was like, that. I was like jumping up and down as telling my sister Renee, it's like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Coding, robotics. I love it because I do all that. AI, yeah. yeah, AI, AI, everything, right? <laughs> and because of that, she she didn't know if she would change her career, focus field. And then she did see two girls in the computer science area. Two. Mm -hmm. All the rest, boys. Right. When girls only see one or two other girls, they get excited, but at the same time, it's why. We ask, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. Girls need to see other girls in those roles as well. They need to know that they can find a tribe, especially when they right. go off to college. And if they don't have their tribe, they're going to fail. The same thing in high school. Those girls dropping out, not mean they're pursuing, if your choice is psychology or your choice is AP chemistry, most girls right now will choose psychology mm -hmm. because of the brain-based readiness. They want the detail, the organization. We all love that. But AP chemistry can be just as exciting. Mm -hmm. It can be really exciting. I agree. But when they have to choose, that's not really fair. So again, getting back to your question, we need more opportunities again to mentor these girls. And mentoring, we've got to find ways that we have got to find after school, before, or during the day programs for these girls so that they can even find basically a field force to help them come together because there's not enough support in our schools right now, what we're finding, and the funding has been cut for a lot of this. Yeah. But when we look at worldwide concepts where we're leave, going to, the biggest job portal is going to be is probably is healthcare technology. Right. And healthcare technology can still be the nurse, can still be the psychologist. But at the same time, it's all of this AI technology that's coming. Who's going to support the companionship robotics that are going to be like in our homes when you and I maybe won't go to a nursing home. We're going to stay at home. And uh -huh. we're going to have computer companion robot to be with us. So when our kids check up on us, we've actually got somebody there. Somebody needs to know how to program it, how to maintain it, how to troubleshoot it. Mm -hmm. We've got to find more opportunities for girls to be exposed to what they're truly passionate about. And some of that really resonates them with the detail, the organization, and just the empathy focus. That's where girls are at. They love that. They want to help. They want to uh, communicate together. They want to build the next great thing. But we've got to find a way to help girls form their communities or find their tribes is what we have to do. So we as leaders need to help them with that. That's great. I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I was I was a girl in STEM. Okay. And I mean, I went to engineering school and I was the only, only female in my class um, at the University mm -hmm. of Washington. And I was treated differently. Exactly. And that was, you know, 25 years ago, but still it was... Yeah. So, and I, so I know exactly where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So, and actually I'm writing an article um, about this. Uh, oh, you are? This, yeah. In the okay. Next that's couple fascinating. Weeks. Yeah. About my experiences as a female in STEM. So yeah, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting and, uh, and I'm hoping that we can make an impact and I love that you're doing what you do. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, our hour's almost up and okay. I can't believe it. And we need to start winding down. Can you let our listeners know how they can get in touch with you, Naomi? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to say that I just worked many, many hours on just refreshing my web page this last year. That was my 2020 focus right away. So I dug into it right over the break. <laughs> and so my landing page for Innovative Educator Consulting is just my name. So it's NaomiHarm.org. And it's 
individuals can find me there. People know me as Naomi, but they also know me as the consulting company that I own and have these one, uh, brilliant women that I work with as part of that. I am actually on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter too. It's just at Naomi Harm. Mm-hmm. I'm on Facebook and Facebook gives you the different types of choices of innovative educator consulting. So as our company that is there and LinkedIn, I'm on there as well as Naomi Harm. Yeah, that's great. And I read that you have a keynote speech coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I have a couple of keynote speeches. So I, I guess the online one in, in February. Oh, yes, that one is great because the other ones I just I just finished, as I mentioned, the one for mm-hmm. ISTE in Canada. And right. then I also was in Denmark for Lego education. Ah. That was probably a highlight of my career. I can't tell you that. <laughs> I think awesome. <laughs> if I was 20 years younger, I think I would uproot everybody and I would go and live in Denmark for the rest of my life. I'm not kidding. If you have haven't gone there, you have to go. My husband did business over there and he loved it. Oh, yeah. I just loved yeah. it too. Uh-huh. But the upcoming keynote speech is all is an online free conference. So mm-hmm. it's ed tech for the future. And what I love about this conference in particularly is that we bring teachers worldwide. It doesn't matter where you're from, which country you're from, which political rival that we're not getting along with currently, but everybody comes together. There's no difference. That's what I love about this. And uh, the keynote that I'm giving is really how to future-proof our students for the skills for 2030. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we Ah, talked about today. And then I've got some great handouts and things for the teachers as well, because how do we prepare, you know, our students to be that next rewilder we talk about? Uh You know, there's different terms like that. How do I help my students prepare to be the next social media um, specialist or how to be the chief experience officer. You yeah. Know, you think about that. We're going to have different job titles, but we're going to have to focus on really taking care of ourselves in order to make it through 2030. So that's why it's really important that we offer design thinking strategies to build the empathy focused classroom build to help our students be better collaborators, communicators, and also to be more compassionate learners with each and every one of every ability. That's awesome. So everybody should be going there okay. to that conference. It yes. is free. It's absolutely uh, free. Yes. yes. And I believe you just tweeted about that either this morning or yesterday. So yeah. if, mm-hmm. if people follow you on Twitter, they'll see that. Um, okay. So thank you so much, Naomi, for joining us. It's been a really great show and I've actually learned a lot as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> so you. I'm very happy that you were here with us today. And I will actually post links to all of the things we talked about today, uh, the mentoring organizations, mm-hmm. um, things like that. And just a reminder to our listeners that although this is live, we do record and release this out as a podcast. So please subscribe to The Learnish Show on Apple, uh, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, wherever your platform of choice is. I wanted to take a minute for VP MMA or Veteran Project Manager Mentor Alliance. My husband and I are now board members there, and we've actually been... uh, Uh, charged with taking care of the golf tournament. And that golf tournament is on April 19th at the Legacy Golf Club here in Phoenix. We need sponsors, golfers, and merchandise donations. You can go to www.thevpmma.org slash golf. And that's Victor uh, Peter Mary Mary Alpha dot org slash golf to sign up and help support veterans as they transition into careers in project management. And then, of course, thank you to our li- our sponsor, The Learnist. Visit thelearnist.com for more information on how we can help you or your organization. So that's it for now. Thanks for listening. We will be back next month on the second Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. Arizona time. That's Mountain Standard Time right now, right? Uh, on that show, we will have CEO of Schmoop, Andy Rodden, joining us. To, so be sure to tune in for a conversation with Andy about how Schmoop builds tools that give all students equal opportunity to succeed through easing the stress of the learning environment. And thanks again to our guest today, Naomi Harm. Mm-hmm.